Namaskar. Welcome to this uh, presentation of uh, the tradition and culture in India. And uh, it is a great honor for me to be a part of this event. And it's greater honor for me to be addressing the students and the aluminos and maestros of UAEH. I shall name my presentation as uh, India Una Experiencia, that is India Ek Ahsas. Ek Ahsas is Experiencia in Hindi. Just to give you an introduction of the country, India, or we say in Hindi, Bharat, is it's a peninsular region referred to as the subcontinent between the Himalayas and the Bay of Bengal. The history of India dates back to the Indus Valley civilization, uh, nearly third millennium BC, and it came under the British uh, supremacy for nearly 300 years. And uh, then later, the nationalist movement started in India under the very able and epoch changing leadership of Mahatma Gandhiji. And later, India became a republic within the Commonwealth in 1950. It is a multi-religious, multilingual, multi-ethnic country. When I say multi-religious, multi-ethnic, multilingual, we will see in our PPT how these factors have been reflected in India's culture and tradition. And uh, as I said in the beginning, the Hindi name is Bharat and uh, a country which is in South Asia. Let me start with my presentation. Well, let me introduce myself. I am Dr. Srimati Das, first secretary and director of Gurudev Tagore Indian Cultural Center, Embassy of India at Mexico City. This center is named after Gurudev Tagore, Gurudev Rabindranath Tagore, a doyen and one of the sons of the soil of India. He was the first non-European recipient of the Nobel Prize in Literature. Much venerated, much respected all over the world. Continuing with my presentation, which I title as uh, uh, India, uh, una experiencia and uh, India ek ahsas. We have these all uh, tables for you where we talk about. I will start with namaskar, and that is what we call as salutation, religions and spirituality, languages and literature, food, marriage, festivals, epics, sculpture and architecture, <clears throat> painting, agriculture, clothing, music, and dance. These are just some examples because we cannot constrict the concept of India within these closed parameters. But due to the paucity of time, I shall be restricting myself to all these different aspects of Indian tradition and culture. Let me start with the first one, which we call as Namaskar or we say namaste. And this means when I bring my two hands together, I say, I bow to you. I bend before you. We are greeting each other. And it means, also means, may our minds meet. And for that, this word namaste comes from the Sanskrit word namaha. Na ma, the two words which we have here, two parts of the word. Na ma means not mine. It means, signifies that when I bow before you, it signifies I am reducing my ego in the presence of you. So it is a reduction of my aham or me before you. So I am becoming modest when I say namaskar. This is more in reference to the COVID pandemic times when shaking hands was not, not at all uh, advisable. 
because of the transmission of the virus. So this namaste or namaskar took off and we see even many foreign ambassadors and the head of the states, they are greeting each other with this namaskar. This is typical Indian culture and tradition. Namaste to you. I will go to the next slide and we talk about the culture of India, which is a amalgamation of subculture spread all over the Indian subcontinent and tradition. Though India is multi-religious, multilingual, and multi-ethnic, but there are certain base in India, which is common to everyone. And that is called as the amalgamation, the mixing of the culture and the subculture. All these traditions and cultures of India are millennia old. They are not new. Only thing they must have been updated or they must have given a different contour, a different shape during the modern times. Otherwise, it has started from millennium years old. Now, several elements of India's diverse culture are multi-ethnic and multi-religious, like uh, Indian religion, yoga, cuisine, clothing, festival, languages, etc. So this all thing comes together, and this mixture is called as amalgamation. I hope you enjoyed this presentation. With this brief introduction, I go to my next slide, which talks about religion and spirituality. Now, India, as I told you, is a cohesive culture. It has a cohesive cultural existence. And we can track back our civilization to the Indus Valley civilization, which is nearly 4,500 years old. But well, this is debatable. Many people say 7,000, many people say 6,000. But again, we take the cutoff mark as the Indus Valley civilization, which is 4,500 years old. Now, India is the birthplace. This is where all these religions have taken place. I mean, the birth has taken place. Hinduism, of course. Then we have Buddhism. We have Jainism, Christianity, Sikhism, and Islam. Now, Islam is the Muslim culture. And this has come to us from the invaders, that is, the Mughal and the Islamic invasion. But we have adapted and we have made it as our own. Now, in India, that country, we all live together. All these different cultures with the different religious ethnicity, we live together in harmony and in brotherhood. Now, if we look into the, as I told you, the multi-religious country, and we had all these things with us from the age millennium, we have different temples of worship. Hinduism have got the temple of worship. Jainism, Christianity have their churches of worship. Buddhism have their own, we have their own uh, uh, what you call as the meditation centers. Sikhism have, Islam have their mosque. And Every one of them is an architectural wonder. So it is not only going and praying inside, but it is also a part of our architecture, our tradition, our culture. So this is how everyone lives in harmony, praying according to his God, his liking, his faith, and his belief. Languages and literature. This is a very, very uh, complex, and I'm sure people from other countries will really feel it like mind-boggling kind of thing. How can a country exist with so many languages and so many ethnic languages, tribal languages? And we have got languages from the villages too. Now, it is said in India that uh, Indian languages are divided into two linguistic families. One comes from the Indo-European, spoken by the 75% of the Indian population. The rest is the Dravidian, particularly from the southern side, where we have the 25% of the population. And then we have, uh, there are two articles in the Indian constitution, which is 346 and 345, which recognizes um, 
two official languages in India. This is the uniqueness of India. We do not have one official language. We have two, and that is English and Hindi. And the Hindi is coming from the uh, Devnagari script. And English, of course, we got it as a blessing, a boon from the Britishers who ruled us for 300 years. They have gone back, but they have left their language with us, which we have adapted to our own language and literature. I, I would like to talk to you about something like literature. Like you have British English. Today we have got Indian English. We have the writers writing in the Indian English literature. Basically, I am a writer of Indian English literature. All my publications are on Indian English literature. Now, what do you mean by Indian English literature? We adopt the English language, but somewhere we try to make it our own. And when we make it our own, we have given a different nomenclature to it, and we call it as uh, Indian English, like you have Australian English, you have American English, you have got uh, African, Afro-American English, you have got those Nigerian English, we too have it, we have got Indian English, and the books are very, very popular and being taught as a course course book in many uh, international universities too. And in India, we have got 23 languages, official languages, and that is 22 plus one, 22 languages plus English. English is very important in India because our education system is still on the Macaulay system of education. Now, uh, a fact which I want to share with you, uh, I'm sure you will be really awed with this, and this is the only country in the world which has, has it. It is 121 languages are spoken in India. Any part of India you go, you can hear 121 languages and 270 mother languages, mother tongues. Like you say that when the mother language, it is what taught to the children. And this is what we call as mother tongues. English is the second language in India as it stems from history during the British rule. After independence too, the language has lingered on. And we have accepted many languages, like in India it is said, every 15 kilometers we have got a different dialect of the same language. So it becomes a different language, a different culture, a different dialect. And it is such a mind boggling thing. Unless you are an Indian, you will feel that, oh my God, what is happening at every 15 kilometers of our transition? But for an Indian who are born with a tongue, an Indian is born with the tongue of a language. For an Indian, picking up language is very easy because they have been accustomed to this kind of exposure because of many reasons. And in India, any given child, any given child will speak more, four languages or more. So it is called as a three language formula we teach in our school. Our, our schools, though they have the mother tongue, instruction, but they have to learn the English as well as Hindi or Sanskrit. Sanskrit is the classical language of India. So we will talk about Sanskrit later in our next session. But here it is, India in fact ranks, uh, uh, in, in, if you talk about the language part of it, we have got um, many words in Hindi which has been accepted in the English dictionary today. We have got uh, uh, like, uh, Avatar is a Hindi word accepted in the English dictionary today, either Oxford or Cambridge. Then we have jungle, which is for the forest, but jungle is a Hindi word. We have tank, the water tank. Tank is a tanki, we say in Hindi. Tanki has become tank in English. And then we have shampoo. Yes, what we use to wash our hair. The shampoo is a Indian Hindi word accepted as shampoo in English dictionary. We have roti, roti like tortillas, what you have. Roti is made out of the corn, made out of the wheat flour, and this is the basic ingredient of the North Indians in India. As we have rice, we have the rotis, and this is also very important. Today, if you open any dictionary, Cambridge or the Oxford, you can find the word roti there. 
then we have chutney what you have like moles we have made different kind of chutneys because it is said an indian tongue needs something sour or something hot while having their food all the three times of the day there are many words which i may not be able to share now but you could go on listing how many hindi words are there in the english dictionary and then uh, i'm sure all of you have heard about palindrome palindrome is an english word which means the word which is spelt the same way from the left to right and right to left and the largest palindrome word in english language is malayalam now you can see it on the screen m a l a y a l m now you try to read it from the left uh from the right to the left uh you will be reading the same way and that is what is called as the palindrome and the largest english word of palindrome comes from india and uh, uh, uh after, after that i would like to talk to you something about how indian literature is crossing boundaries the geographical boundaries and how they have become very important either in translation or they have because it has to be in translation when you have 22 official languages indian literature is a very rich literature but the people like for example in mexico if you want to read a bengali literature a book written by rabindranath tagore you have to read it in english so all of them have been translated into english because english is a world language whether we like it or we don't like it well, i love it and if you like it so you have to read all the translations in english like if i want to read a wonderful book from mexico in spanish i tell my people give it to me in english because i want to enjoy the literature of mexico from into the english language so english is our connect language as we say so this is the english i mean the language and the literature part of it this is also multi hued multi cultured like the multi religiosity which is in existing in india we go to the next slide that is the food and the spices i'm sure everyone loves food all of us love food that's why we call ourselves as foodie and particularly mexico and india they are known as food lovers and india as you as as always uh, different regions have got different food now it is known for love of food and spices now spices which are used in indian cooking every day is fresh we do not store our spices most of them uh, nowadays the working women they have to store their spices because of the paucity of time but generally good cooking in india is hot spicy and the spices are grounded on the spot and then it is used for cooking and in india as it is a multi religious multi ethnic country we have got different foods from northern southern eastern western these are the four basic regions but within northern also we have got south northern east northern you know as any country will have it and these are all different kind of cuisines we have and uh, because uh, of these different kind of cuisines which are very popular all over the world indian restaurants do a lot of business and uh, because india is the world's second largest producer of food after india it has to be because it has to cater to its 1.30 billion population not only that india not only produces india also shares india has got sharing of food it is our culture we share our food we share our ideas we share our tradition we share our culture even food is shared by the indians but with the neighbors with the guests and there is a saying in india where we say atithi devo bhava atithi is guest devo is god bhava is we consider so for us any guest coming to the house the first thing is namaste then we tell them to sit down we offer them a glass of water water is never asked in india do you want a glass of water you always give the water first then you ask would you like to have coffee and tea but water is the basic in india we offer and after that we offer food whatever may be the kind of food you may be having only one tortilla with you but we share the tortilla and wheat that is why india is known for sharing the food whether the raw material or the cooked one with our 
people who really want to have our kind of hospitality. So food and spices. And here I would like to talk about two things. One is um, tomatoes form the base of our curries, or you say curries, C-U-R-R-I-E-S. Indian curries are very famous. And the base for most of our cooking and food is the tomatoes. We grow in large numbers, whether it is a green or the, or the red ones. Without a tomato, our cooking or our eating is not complete. Second thing which is very common in India is every Indian loves three things. He loves tandoori, he loves kebabs, and he loves biryani. Now, biryani is a spicy rice made with uh, the, 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 the mutton, either from the sheep or from the uh, chicken. And uh, tandoori's and kebabs are made out of uh, chicken or it is made out of uh, fish. Yes, and tandoori is particularly made out of chicken. But let me tell you one thing, that this tandoori and the kebabs are not basically Indian. They have been brought to us by our invaders, like Persian invaders and the Mughal invaders. So when the invaders came to us, they have given us many good things and they have gone. Like, for example, when uh, Britishers ruled over us, we learned to eat how to eat cakes and pastries. India never knew what is a cake and a pastry. They left it back to us, and today, in India, there is a famous pastry shop, which is the branch of the pastry shop, which is in Britain. And we we, we, we call it as, uh, I'm not getting the name of that. And it's a very famous pastry shop. And people travel all over India to Kolkata, the eastern part, because Britishers came there first to eat this pastry made at this particular pastry area. And the cake, cake was never known to us. Happy birthday was never known to us. We learned to cut the cake from the Britishers. Well, there are many good things which came to us from the Britishers, and most of them are on the food and the cuisine and the literature and the education system. We adopt. Adaptation is the Indian base of Indian culture and tradition. We adopt. Even Mexican food is very popular in India. Every city will have at least one or two Mexican restaurants, and people love Mexican food in India because of the spicy nature of the Mexican food. And second thing what I would like to talk about is that dishes again differ according to the region, climate, religion, language spoken. Because one man's food, though it may not be other man's poison in India, but Indian love to taste the food from other regions too. But they are very particular about the food what they eat. So when you go to India, the first thing you do is to eat Indian cuisine. And the last part of this, uh, this uh, slide would be the street food in India, which is very famous, very popular, like we have in Mexico too, street food. And these are all spicy. Uh, in India, for spicy, we say chatpata. Chatpata. Chatpata means spicy. And this kind of food are very popular, particularly all age group. There is no one age group eating this street food. It is very popular in all the events, in all the festivals, along with the regular a la carte food. We go to the next one, <coughs> the marriage system. Very important. Marriage is not a contract in India. Marriage between a girl and a boy is a sacrament. When I say sacrament, it has been ordained from, it has been previously arranged by God. It has been ordained by our fate and our destiny. Like if I have to marry a person in India, well, I'm married. If I if I marry my person, my my man, now he may be from another region and I may be for another region, but I have been ordained. My fate ordains me, my, de my destiny ordains me, and that is how it is called as a sacrament and not a contract. And it is believed, though nowadays nobody believes in it, that once you marry, you not marry once, you marry for seven births. You get married to the same man 
or he gets married to the same woman for seven birth. Of course, this is the belief of the religion, of our customs, but uh, regular days we may not believe in it. So, and there are many kinds of marriages in India. Out of that, three would be arranged marriages, love marriages, and the third would be the Gandharva marriages. Arranged marriage, even in 2022, is very popular in India and much, much respected because they think that when there is an arranged marriage, it is the two families who meet together. They say, I have a girl and you have a son. Why don't we get them married? So it is said in India, when two people get married, it is not the marriage between two people. It is a marriage between two families. So there is an extended family. And uh, if there are three or four kids in the house, the entire family broadens and everybody lives like one large, huge family. Marriages are very ostentatious in India. A lot of money is spent on marriages in India because for a parent, getting the son married or the daughter married is his be-all and end-all of his life. A girl may be highly placed in academic may be highly placed in her job, may be a thorough professional, but she has to marry or she wants to marry. I won't say she has to marry. She wants to marry because marriage is not only a union between a girl and a boy. Marriage is a, a, a promise to continue with the generation in India with a society's sanction. And this sanction is called as a marriage. Of course, love marriages are very, very common nowadays. But even though there is a love marriage, the parents have to come together and they have to perform the marriage. It is not only the boy and the girl who goes out, gets married and come back. As I told you, in, in, in modern times, this too also happens. But as tradition and in culture, Indians do not prefer love marriages. They still prefer arranged marriages. For example, my son has got an arranged marriage. And so that is how it happens. And dowry. Dowry is a particular phenomenon in India. I'm sorry. I'm sure there are other countries too, which gives the money, you know, takes the money from the girl's father, parents, and takes the girl away for uh, for life. And there are some states in India where the boy pays the money to the girl and then he brings the girl home. You know, he endows her with everything movable, immovable property. So dowry is a very important thing in India. And it is said that, and it is said that a parent starts saving for a girl's wedding from the day she is born. So these are very important in India. But it has also created many problems in the society. So government has outlawed by the Indian government now. Even there is no legal sanction to take dowry or to give the dowry. Any marriage in India is a long affair. It is a huge celebration. And no celebration is less than uh, two weeks because it is full of dance, music, customs, traditions, and every day of the movement, you have got one tradition to take care of. So when the girl goes to another person's house, she carries the culture of her father's family into that family. And she amalgamates herself into that family because she promises her husband to take forward the generation of his family. So this marriage is very important, very sacred, and Divorces are common nowadays because of the pressure of the modern life. But even then, 100 times a girl or a boy thinks before they jump into this kind of decisions. Because it is said, once you're married, you're married for seven lives. Festivals. Festivals in India are also multi-religious, multilingual, multi-ethnic multi kind multiple kind of celebrating these festivals we have got different states different region also within one state in india as i told you there are 29 states even within the state there are different different festivals which are celebrated by different ethnic people now india is a land of festivals it is said in india believed in india if there are 365 days in a calendar leap year or no leap year 
there are 366 festivals in India. So 365 days and 366 festivals. India is a land of festivals because it has to cater to all the religion. Like we have Navaratri, the nine day celebration. Diwali, it is called as the festival of lights. Ganesh Chaturthi, it is the festival of Lord Ganesha, where we celebrate his uh, coming and uh, his presence on this earth. Durga Puja, it is a 10-day affair where the uh, goddess Durga, you must have seen some pictures. She has 10 arms, and that is the celebration of the women. And uh, Holi, the color festival. We have Raksha Bandhan, a very famous festival between the uh, brother and the sister. And uh, in India, the festivals are also very uh, relationship bound. Like you have festivals for husband and wife. You have festivals for mother, father, children. You have the festivals for parents. Like you have Mother's Day, you have Father's Day. In India, we don't have Mother's Day and Father's Day, but you have a festival of a mother where the children pray the mother. So these are all part of this religious, cultural uh, scenario in India. And the Raksha Bandhan is a very beautiful one. It is one of my favorites. Uh, there where the sister tries a thread on the wrist of the brother, like uh, what you have a friendship band kind of thing. She ties it on the wrist of the brother and the brother promises the sister that I shall take care of you. Even after you're married, I'm there for you. If you want to come back, my door is open. I will take care of you. My shelter is there for you. You are my responsibility. So um, uh, Raksha Bandhan is, uh, Raksha is protection. Bandhan is the uh, tie, the thread, the friendship band, what you have. So this is a very sweet festival between the brother and the sister. Even if you don't have your own brother, the family steps in, her cousin may come in, her friends may come in, and they become the brothers for life and sisters for life. So it's a very cute uh, festival, and uh, it is celebrated all through the regions in India. Dashera, dash, das means 10. And uh, era is the celebration. A uh, festival which is celebrated for 10 days is called as the Dashera. It is also called as the, 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 the victory of the good over the evil. And that's why we burn the effigy of the bad. And this is what is called as the Dashera. Ramzan is an Islam festival, Muslim festival, which is celebrated in all gaiety, with all propriety, with all importance, because India is a multi-religious country, equal importance is given to Christmas, equal importance is given to Ramzan. In fact, I have many friends who are Muslims, who are Christians, very close to me, and we celebrate together the Ramzan and the uh, and the uh, Christmas. And uh, so it, it is like existing in harmony and uh, and sharing all your joys with your friends and your relatives. So India has got a lot of festivals and a lot of celebrations which is spread throughout the year, throughout the year. Because when you have so many religions, you have to have so many festivals. So it is a land of festivals. We go, these are some of the pictures. You can see this is the Ganesh Chaturthi. This is Onam, the New Year's Day in Kerala, deep down south. This is in Bhuvaneshwar. These are the chariots which are drawn by the people. It is in the East India, Central East India. Then we have uh, Bihu, which is of Eastern India, celebrating the festival of harvesting, which you have in Mexico too. This is the color festival. These are the fest uh, mosque. You have Ramzan. So you have got... Different, different. This particular figure is burning, as I told you, the Shera. We burn the effigy of the evil and it is totally burnt away so that uh, the goodness takes over the country, the people, the family. So these are all celebrated all through the year across the country and everyone celebrates whether it belongs to me or it doesn't belong to me. Then we have epics. Uh, this section is my favorite. And because we say epics in India is not a book written in a, in a much uh, uh, longer form. Epics in India is itihasa. Itihasa means history. 
the two epics in India, which all of you must have heard about it, the Ramayana and the Mahabharata. Though we know it as an epic, but there's nothing mythological in it. These characters in Ramayana and Mahabharata, they are not mythological characters. They have not come from top to down. They are here, they are born here, and they show us how we can become very important like them, how we can become very really uh, reaches like them, how we can become very good like them. So it is to tell the common people, even common people can become Ram. Even common people can become the characters of uh, Dasharatha in Mahabharata. Everybody can become a like God, like goddess. Of course, you can't become like God and we are not God and goddesses, but we can become like them if we follow the footsteps which have been put to us by Ramayana's Rama and Mahabharata's so many characters. So we call them as Itihasa. Something to talk about Mahabharata to you. It is the longest epic in the world. Till today, no other epic can overtake Mahabharata. It is said in Mahabharata, there are 200,000 verses, not lines, 200,000 verses. Each verse can be of four lines or five lines. There are 1.8 million words. One Mahabharata from India is equal to two other very important epics of the world, Iliad and Odyssey. Put Iliad and Odyssey together. It is Mahabharata is 10 times more than Iliad and Odyssey. And it is called as Mahabharata. Maha is great. Bharata is the country. The story of the country is called as Mahabharata. It is also called as Mahakavya. Maha is great, Kavya is poetry. So there are certain words which are words used for Mahabharata, Mahakavya. And I have read Mahabharata quite a lot of times, though without understanding it most of the time. It is very difficult because it is written in Sanskrit, the classical language. Mahatma Gandhi has put Mahabharata, not the entire, the part of Mahabharata where we call it as Bhagavad Gita, the Bhagavad Gita. He calls it as spiritual dictionary of man. If you want to have a very righteous life, you want to have a very peaceful life, you want to have spiritually enriching life, read Bhagavad Gita. It does not belong to one country. It belongs to the entire humanity. So Mahabharata has got a part called as Bhagavad Gita and it is called as the spiritual dictionary of mankind. Ramayana, Ramayana, Yana is the story, Rama is the main protagonist of Ramayana, Lord Rama, and it is a story from the beginning till the end. Rama is called as Purushottam, Purushottam, Puru is man, Shottam, the best of man, Purushottam, the best of man. Why do we call Rama the best of man? Not only he was very good looking, Rama was a very good looking because he was the sixth avatar of uh, Vishnu. That is why he's mostly shown as a blue color. Um, he is the avatar. I told you the word avatar. So avatar. He was, how should a man be? How should a husband be? How should a son be? How should a father be? How should a brother be? How should a family man be? If you really want to know that, it is Ram, who is an epitome of all the virtues of all the parameters of the relationship of human being. We are brothers, we have husbands, we have everywhere the same relationship. But how should you be? That is what is told in the Ramayana. Recently, we are ongoing, the, uh, we are having in Guanajuato, in Leon, in Salamanca, in Mexico City. We have these Lok Me Ram, which we have built it as Mexico Me Ram. We have got all these paintings from Lalitkala Academy, 
Ministry of Culture, Government of India, and Indian Council for Cultural Relations, where these paintings and the uh, graphics have come to us, and we are exposing it to the Mexico uh, Mexicans and to tell that uh, we all can learn something, if not everything, from a character like Lord Rama. Now, Ma, um, as I told you, Mahabharata is written in 200,000 verses. Similarly, Ramayana is written in 28,000 verses, verses. And it is also supposed to be one of the lengthiest epics of the world. And uh, there is the third part of it, that is Bhagavad Gita, as I told you just now, and that is the Mahabharata. So these are the two epics from India. You could read them. It is there in our library. This cultural center has a uh, all these with us. Whenever you want, you can get in touch with us and we can share all these material with you. And this all depends on your interest after my presentation is over. Not only on the epics, we have got on all the culture and the traditions of India. This library is open for you. Please do make use of it. Sculpture and architecture. And architecture in India is supposed to be one of the most important, uh, uh, which again dates back to the Indus Valley civilization, where we have the stone and the bronze figures. If you come to India, the second thing what you have to see is the architecture spread over all over India. Different regions in India are called by different architectures. There are five basic architecture styles in India. One is the Hindu architecture, which you can find in the temples of India, particularly in South India. Then you have the Indo-Islamic architecture. Indo-Islamic architecture and Mughal architecture, the third one, is because of the invaders who came here. After they came here, they have left their blueprint with us. We have accepted. We are adopt. We love other people who come to our country. They may invade us, but they are our friends. We welcome them with open hands. And when they went back, they left their artisans with us. And this is how we have Taj Mahal with us today. The Taj Mahal, which is called as Magic in Marvel. And it is called Magic in Marvel, Marble in the Moonlight, and which Shah Jahan had built for his beloved wife to treasure her memory after her death. It's a mausoleum. It is not a temple. You should come here. And the third thing what you have to do in India after coming here is go and see the Taj Mahal because it is seen to be believed. It is not made in on this earth. It is made in heaven, thrown on this earth. That is what the historians say. It is a beautiful Agra. It is about uh, 200 kilometers from Delhi, the capital city of India. Do visit Agra. It is a beautiful city to be visited only for Taj Mahal. Then we have got the Rajput architecture. Then we have got Indo-Sarsenic architecture. Indo-Sarsenic is a very modern one where we have the houses built in the Baroque styles. And this is a combination of many influences like Spanish, the Spanish influence, though Spanish never invaded us, but uh, we, but Portuguese have invaded us. Maybe they brought it to us, the Baroque style. We have French, we have French influence in the deep down south of India called as Pondicherry, Puducherry, the new name, where all the buildings are French style. So India is a land of all architecture. You want to see architecture on one land? Come to India because you have everything there. There is something for everybody. So if you want to say food, you want to taste, see architecture, do come to India. One of the special things of Indian architecture, we call it as cave architecture. The cave architecture, we have the large, world's largest monolithic cave. Monolithic cave is, the cave is carved out of a single stone. Single stone. When you go inside the cave, you see a lot of frescoes, you see a lot of figurines, you see a lot of statues, the sculpture, and all these things have come inside the cave and they have been brought by the invaders, influence of the invaders. And here I would like to mention, <coughs> out of UNESCO's list of 830 World Heritage Sites, 26 of these are on Indian soil. So when you come to India, make a list of those 26 uh, buildings which are there on the UNESCO heritage size list. You come, you see it, and when you see those 26, you have seen the entire world. 
that is what they say in India that visit India once you have the experience of a lifetime. That is why I call my session as India Una Experiencia. You have to experience India. You cannot understand India by my talk. You cannot understand India by reading the books. You have to experience India. Please go to India or please come with me to India and you will see what India has to offer for you. So temple architecture, cave architecture, there are very beautiful caves in India called as the Ajanta, Elora, Badami. Then we have got the other kind of, uh, because all this depends upon the geographical conditions again. The, again, it goes on the regional variation. It also goes on the racial variation. Even architecture is racial based. So when you visit India, you will have a great variety of show before your eyes. Then we go to the next one. These are a few of the pictures which we picked up for you. <coughs> Buddha, then we have got Hampi here. That's very close to my town. That is the Chalukyas. There are many, uh, even inside kingdoms who have given their influence of the architecture in India. It is not only the invaders. We have Gupta, we have got uh, Vijayanagar, we have got Chalukyas. There are many, many influence in India. When the country is so old, like Mexico, influences are also old. And we keep it, we treasure it, we adapt to it. That is the beauty of, I feel even Mexico has adapted to all these invaders. Paintings. Now, paintings, we have got uh, the frescoes inside those Ajanta Elora temples. As I was just telling you, these are called as the cave architecture. These are thousands of years old. The color has not faded. Some things must have been retouched, but most of these are made out of the dyes, out of the plants and the flowers and the seeds, the pollen grains, which comes out of these flower. It is said every region in India has a different pollen grains. The botanists, I don't know how they will look at it, but these pollen grains are used to create the dyes thousands of years back, and they were used to draw these figurines in, in India. Now, if an Indian woman want to be shown as a beautiful woman, they pick up this Apsara. Her name is Apsara, and she is there in the Ajanta cave. So if you want to say an Indian woman, as beautiful, as whom? As Apsara, not as a film star. In India, we don't consider film star as the epitome of beauty. It is these frescoes which are present in Ajanta Elora caves, and they are there on the, they are on the walls, they are on the roof, and again, as I told you, India has to be believed, seen to be believed. Before I move on to the next slide, I would like to talk here one sentence about all these paintings, all these buildings, all the architecture in India have taken care of the nature, which the modern day dams and all may not take care. So these have taken care of the nature and there is a beautiful harmony, balance between art and nature. If anybody knows how to preserve nature, it was our ancient Indians, which I can't speak about the present Indians. Okay. Agriculture. Well, India is very well placed, very well uh, able to take care of her food bowl. Again, different regions of India talk about different food habits. <coughs> Even the agriculture produced in India changes according to the geographical region. It is everywhere. Now, it is the global leaders in agriculture sector after the green revolution in India, which changed the face of India. Today, we are the second largest producer of rice and wheat in India. Particularly, I would like to talk here about the basmati rice, which has been patented. And uh, today, if you really want to know what is rice, eat the basmati rice. And that is from India. And it comes from North India, mind you. Uh, Basmati rice cannot be grown in South India at all, maybe because of the uh, weather condition and the geographical need. Not only rice and wheat, we are leaders. Uh, wheat, uh, I'm sure, I was doing some reading on Mexican wheat production, where you call it as a, uh, uh, you had here a wheat, uh, a Sonora variety of wheat you have here. 
and which has been taken by the Indians. And today they have learned from Mexico how to grow the Sonora variety of wheat. India is one of the greatest producers of cotton, sugarcane, where we make the sugar, the uh, azuka, as you say, peanuts, jute, tea, spices, pulses, etc. One word about the tea here, what you say, chai, the masala chai. India is the lone grower of a particular kind of tea which grows in Darjeeling uh, to the eastern side of India, a hill station, where we call it as orange pico. Pico is the tip of the tea leaves. It is orange in color. It is beautiful. It is orange in color. That orange part is broken away and a tea is made out of that. Very expensive. It is not sold in tons or in kilograms. It is sold in grams. It is sold in grams because it is so very expensive. And they say to make a cup of tea, one or two shred of orange pico is enough. So spices, of course, spices came even to Mexico from India. If you see the uh, people who traveled by the ship from Kerala, from the south of India, there are many spices which came to Mexico, which you have adopted now, and that was brought from India. A lot of studies can be done on the spices because I am told that uh, many spices in Mexico have Indian origin. Pulses is also Indian born, what you call as dal. We go, these are all the different uh, facets of Indian. Now, you might be thinking they are so about, I mean, so ancient in their agricultural methods. But let me tell you, we have mechanisms. We have got a lot of machines which produce so much of food for so many people. But many villagers, many farmers in the rural in, uh, area in India, they prefer to till their lands, to harvest their crops with their own hands because they feel that they feel that harvesting, tilling the land is they are taking from their mother earth what they need for themselves and their family. So this is the obeisance. This is the worship, what a farmer does to his land. And these are the cows. And cow is considered to be the mother in India. That's why it is a very revered, a very worshipped animal in India because cow is the animal which works for our food feeds our family, feeds our children, and this all comes from the cow and the earth. So India is the largest producer of rice and wheat in India. So this is how India has gained a combination of the traditional method of farming and also the new method of machinization. Clothing. Textile in India is very, very famous. Textile in India is one of the most important avenues for employment generation in India. As the weavers in India, the artisans in India, the embroiderers in India. So India, when you have 130 billion population, they need to be clothed too. But Indians not only clothe themselves, they also clothe themselves with all the material available, different kind of clothes available, different kind of styles available existing from north, south, east, and west. Adaptation is again there. So adaptation is not only of the invaders to India. Adaptation is also within the country. So we adapt. Like I wear something which is from North India, though I belong to East India, and the South Indians will adopt something belonging to the West India. So these are kind of what you call as a wonderful coexistence, not only of culture, not only of tradition, but also of food and textile. Indians love to dress up. And this dressing up is two important basic styles of dressing. One is the sari, which six. We call it as six yards wonder, a cloth, a dress without any stitch on it. And the sari is worn by Indians, Indian women, Indian women, at least during her wedding and during the festival time. Every Indian woman will have saris in her wardrobe, however modern or updated or however busy she may be. She will have saris in her wardrobe belonging to different regions of India. Indian men, they have stopped wearing the dhotis, as you say, the loose garments, what is available. But now they have shifted over to the Western concept of trousers and a shirt and the suit during the meetings. But 
during the festival, even today, Indian men, they wear the traditional costume. Particularly in the wedding time, you will never find a man sitting with a trouser and a shirt. I'm talking about the ceremony time. In the evening reception, he may wear a suit, but a designer suit, a tailored suit. But during the wedding time, he will wear his uh, particular region ethnic costume it is a must and it happens also and they look very nice and uh, and uh, this again in clothing in india textile manufacturing unit employ the biggest uh, employment generator and the clothing in india depends upon the climatic condition depends upon the region depends upon the religiosity yes that is very important for indians how to dress up according to their religion so clothing or we say vestimenta vestimenta is very very important for an indian to be known as an indian if you see an indian lady immediately you could make out that she is Indian because she is wearing the sari with a small bindi on her forehead. And bindi is also a very important factor for an Indian because it shows that she is married. A red bindi shows she is married. A black bindi shows that uh, she has. Oh, well, the colors also differ. Red is a sign of marriage. Uh, in the wedding and if a woman continues to wear the red bindi it shows that she is a married woman in India so she wears it with a sari and she wears it with any costume she wears these are all what you call as the symbolism of being an Indian well music and dance when we talk about India how can we not talk about music and dance India is a musical country uh, they have got music everywhere. They have music in the air, they have music in the festival, they have music in the religious ceremony. You, we have got, uh, every ceremony has got the different style of singing. We have got bhajans, we have got so many things. We have got folk, we have got pop, we have got jazz, we have classical music. India is a land of music, land of water, land of food land of textile the land of many things so in india you have got when you have different religion when you have different ethnicity you have different language you should be having different musical instrument there are so many different musical instruments in india that you will be uh, you will be really surprised that many indians also do not know about it there are eight classical dance forms in india which has been there are many out of that uh, there are eight which are very popular and these are also uh, distributed in the regions in India, like South, North, East, and West. And very popular ones, the Bharatnatyam, you have Kathak from North, you have Kuchipudi, you have got from Andhra Pradesh, then you have got uh, Bharatnatyam from Tamil Nadu. So these are all the different, different forms of this Kathakali from deep down South, which tells the story of Mahabharata or a Ramayana through this dressing. And there are folk dances like this in uh, uh, Rajasthan, these are the dances of uh, people in Punjab, and these are all, this is Odyssey, and there are beautiful dance forms in India. And we, in, in our cultural center, we teach four classical dance forms. We teach sitar, the stringed instrument. We teach tabla. And um, in fact, I was just thinking, I was talking to my uh, team in the center that uh, we have the classes starting sometimes next month and uh, we can tie up with UAEH and um, with your university and give you some online classes in this and uh, we can really explore this like uh, you know I can't promise you but I can explore with your uh, with your university if you could take some classes on yoga on dance on music we can offer some online classes to you I know from Pachuka to come here is a big problem so Please make use of our offer and we will talk to your higher ups, your rector and we are uh, esteemed professors and we'll see what we can do for you. It will be a pleasure to share our Indian knowledge with you. We are always at your service. Well, uh, I hate to conclude my talk. I love talking and I hope you enjoyed my talk. And um, now uh, with this conclusion, I had so many things to talk, but your university has not given me enough time to talk. So what I will do is that I will just wind up now and give you in summary what is India could be in a nutshell, in a capsule. Now we call India is a country of unity and diversity. Diversity is a different kind of things and we have unity in the sense we coexist. 
we have cohesiveness, different, different culture, religion, ethnicity, food, dress. Oh, this is a country where it is always something is happening in that country, either in one region or the other. It is such a diverse country, so difficult to believe that when once in four years or five years when India goes for election, the election is stretched for a month because every region of India will be taken into consideration. It is the largest democracy in the world and one government is elected. Can you believe 1.30 billion electing one government? It is such a unique system we have in our country and we are proud of it. Now, Indian culture is known for its customs, religion, spiritual values. We are modern. We are very, very modern. We are postmodern, I would say. Being a teacher of literature, I would call myself as a postmodernist, but I stick to my culture and my uh, tradition. That way, every culture, every even Mexicans stick to their culture and their tradition. That is why maybe there is a beautiful bond forged between India and Mexico, because we both understand how old our country is, how important is our tradition, how important is our culture, and we value and we respect each other. This is the beauty of Indians and the Mexicans. And we are very proud to be here representing the Indian Cultural Center. And I'll be very proud to tell you that some of the facts of India, which you just take it with you, that India is the seventh largest country in the world, area-wise. It is the largest democracy in the world, after U uh, USA being the oldest democracy. And you know, vibrant democracy. India is a vibrant democracy. There is no second thought of what we can have in our country. Yoga and chess originated in India. And the last one, which uh, last but one, is the highest number of languages in this world is spoken in India. Every region in India has got different language to be spoken, different dialect, different script different nuances, different way of talking, pronunciation is so different from one region to the other. And the last but not the least, which is my favorite, is that the most number of the beautiful animals called as tigers, they are from India. Tiger is an Indian animal. And when you go to India, do see a tiger because Indian tigers look different from Mexican tigers. Though the Mexican tigers have come from India, they have changed their looks. Please go to India. First thing you see is that, see an Indian tiger. They look so different, full of culture and full of tradition. You must see that Indian uh, tiger. Well, after such a brief presentation, I'm sure it is a long one. And I hope you enjoyed my presentation. And on behalf of Embassy of India and the uh, ambassador, Dr. Pankaj Sharma, it has been a great privilege for me to address you today as on Indian tradition and culture. So I say we are proud to be Indians. Though I'm proud to be an Indian, I would like to end my talk by saying Viva India, Viva Mexico. Namaskar. Hasta luego.